I am blessed. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I am a member of God's family. I am a Dave. I am alive in Christ. I am holy. I am adopted. I am included. I am born on purpose with a purpose. I am a minister. I am a warrior. We're going to jump right into God's Word today, Ephesians chapter 5. If you've got a Bible, we're going to start with verse 21. Last week, uh, we were in Ephesians chapter 4. Our message was, I am a minister, and so many of you took a next step in what it is to follow Jesus, including 19 people said, I'm going to get baptized in water, which we're going to do two weeks from today. Congratulations to those of you who are there making that step. If you haven't yet made that step, all you got to do is write that down on that connection card. I want to be baptized in water. Turn that in on your way out. And by the way, last week, 23 people said, my next step is to, is to surrender my heart and life to Jesus Christ. We should give God praise for that. Amen. Amen. So thank God. So next week is our last message in this series, Ephesians chapter 6, and you know that that talks about the armor of God, and so the message is, I am a warrior, so it's going to be a great message. But today, we pick it up with Ephesians chapter 5. Let's get right into it. The Bible says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I asked my wife to look over this message and cut out anything that would be hard to hear. So in conclusion, (laughs) may the Lord have a How many would agree that these verses that I just read have been taken out of context more than almost any other verse in the Bible? In fact, some women uh, have been, uh, have a hard time even hearing these verses because some men and even some churches have taken them out of context and used them to subjugate women. Now, I say, Pastor, what are you talking about out of context? Well, I will have to, uh, uh, I will have to quote my friend Inigo Montoya uh, from Princess Bride. He says, uh, you keep using that Bible verse. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> Inconceivable. This is about the best I got today, all right? So... When we talk about taking a verse out of context, there's a couple things. First of all, we, don't, we, we need to understand biblical context. So I'm going to talk about these verses for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to go verse by verse through it. Is that okay? Because we got to get context of what we're talking about. So when we say context, biblical context is first. What does the scripture say before this, these verses, and what does he say after these verses? And of course, we know that the whole letter is about identity. Yeah. Ephesians is about who I am in Jesus. And so Paul is saying, you got to bring who you are in Christ into your home, into your marriage. And he's helping them understand what a Christian family should look like, what a Christian marriage should look like. And of course, we know that in biblical context, that the number one rule of biblical interpretation is scripture interprets scripture. So when we read something in the Bible, especially if it's something that we don't understand or maybe is hard to hear, we need to ask the question, what else does the Bible say about this subject? Did you know that the Bible has a lot to say about families and about marriage? both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. As a matter of fact, almost every New Testament writer talks about marriage. 
So the Bible has a lot to say about marriage. And so we're going to take a good deal of time, and we're going to be in Genesis in the Old Testament and in the New Testament before we ever get to Paul's instructions because we need some biblical context. Now, the other thing you got to talk about is cultural context. Who's the audience that Paul is talking to? What's going on in the circumstances in the situation there? Well, remember that Ephesus was a major city in the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, in the first century, women were not treated well. Uh, The Roman family was dominated by men. Women had about the same rights as children and criminals. Women weren't allowed to own property or manage money because they were thought to be intellectually incapable of handling such things. Women couldn't attend, speak in, or vote in political assemblies, and they couldn't hold any position of responsibility in any sort of political organization. Now, that was just the Roman culture. But you got to remember that in the Ephesians church, there were a lot of Jewish people as well, remember? Remember? So Jewish culture plays a role in this uh, because, in fact, uh, because the, the Jewish culture at that time, they had a high ideal of marriage, but a low view of women. Now, I'm going deep right out of the gate here, so I want you to just really lean in because this is going to pay off here in just a moment. Uh, in fact, part of a morning prayer, a Jewish, a Jewish man often prayed during this time period was... Thank you, God, that you made me not a Gentile, not a slave, nor a woman. Ouch. In those days, a Jewish man could divorce his wife for any reason at all. All he had to do was to get two witnesses, two buddies to agree with him, and she was gone. But a woman had absolutely no rights whatsoever when it came to marriage, least of all the right to divorce her husband. A woman couldn't divorce her husband unless he became a leper ooh, or an apostate. She was bound for life, whereas a husband could get divorced, get married, get divorced, get married. And in the Roman world during this time, there is one documented instance where one Roman man was married to 24 different women. Wow. It's in this culture that Paul writes these words, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How many would agree that would have been a radical statement to hear in the Ephesians church when Paul wrote it? So can I remind you for just a moment, ladies, that you owe your dignity You owe your liberty, you owe your freedom, your raising of status, not to Gloria Steinem or any other feminist. You owe it to Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ who has elevated women to the place that they should be. Now let me recommend a book that I think everybody should read. Uh, I think every Christian should read this and even people who aren't believers should read this, but especially high school students and young adults, it's called How Christianity Changed the World. And it's, it just talks about the effect of Christianity has on culture. And there's an entire chapter talking about how Christianity affected uh, the rights of women. So back to Ephesians chapter 5, Paul begins to apply these truths about who we are in Jesus to the Christian family. And so he's trying to create a picture, hey, this is what it means to be in a Christian marriage. Uh, and, and it's going to be different than the culture that you are currently living in. Now, if you're here today and you say, well, but pastor, I'm single or I'm a widow or a widower or I'm divorced. You're not currently married. Uh, I, I just want to acknowledge right out of the gate that a message like this can, could make you feel left out, especially as we come up on the holiday season. And you might be asking, why, why is this message relevant to me? Well, first of all, let me remind you that God's word is always profitable. Uh, the Bible says that his word will never return void. Uh, and, and God's word is always relevant to everyone. But how many know we also all come from a family? 
If you, it, there's no way you're here without somebody, uh, you know, without a family. And, and how many know as a culture, there is an attack on marriage and family right now. So we got to learn to think right and know what God says about marriage so that we can be part of the solution and speak up for what God's intentions are. Are you with me today? How many are with me? Seven of you are with me. All right, here we go. Now, I think the key verse for this entire paragraph that Paul gives instructions is verse 32. He says, this is a profound mystery. What's he talking about? He's talking about husbands and wives. Husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. Wives submitting to their husbands. He says, this is really what I'm talking about. It's kind of hard. He's basically saying it's kind of hard to understand. And if it was hard to understand when he wrote it, it might be worth a little bit of extra time for us to try to understand what he's talking about in 2022. He goes, what I'm talking about is Christ and the church. We won't understand Paul's instructions about family unless we understand this verse right here. He goes, this is what I'm talking about. What I'm trying to explain to you is really Christ and the church. So in describing the marriage relationship between a man and a woman, Paul paints a picture. He goes, it's about Jesus and the church. It's about the cross. Oh, come on. I want you to lean in on this one, okay? I know it's early. But the cross is the key to the mystery of marriage. Unless we see these verses through the lens of the cross, we're going to take them out of context. And we're going to use it uh, to be a weapon instead of what it's intended to be, which is truth. Come on, somebody. So, listen, uh, if you don't see yourself and your spouse through the eyes of Jesus and the cross, we're never going to understand what Paul's trying to say. Paul's saying, I want, God's idea is that the marriage relationship is to be a reflection of the relationship of Jesus and his bride, the church. God created marriage to help us understand Jesus and the church. Did you know marriage won't last forever? Did you know families won't last forever? What are, you, what are you talking about? Well, Jesus said it in Matthew 22, verse 7, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. There's no marriage in heaven. Are, are you getting this? So marriage and family are temporary. They're just for this life. God created it for the earth. He didn't create it for heaven. I'm going to slow down a little bit. God created fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters to be an illustrated sermon so that we could understand who he is, his love for us, and our relationship with him. Let me illustrate it to you this way. When my oldest son, Braden, was born, Uh, It was an emergency C-section, so I didn't get to be in the room when he was born, and I had to be in this waiting room. And so here they come, and they bring my son, and they put him in my arms. And the first thing I went was, wow, this is a big kid. (laughs) I didn't expect that. But you know what else I didn't expect? I didn't expect to feel the way I felt at that moment. How do I love this little piece of flesh as much as I do right now. Something flipped in my heart, in my spirit. And can I tell you that I've never prayed our Father who art in heaven the same way ever again. Because I understand a little bit deeper what it means that God is my Father. Are you getting this today? So God created marriage to show himself on the earth. Another way to put it is this way, marriage represents God on the earth. Now Robert Morris uh, does a fantastic job uh, teaching about this in a, in a message he calls the blessed marriage. 
And so I'm going to attempt to summarize what, what he teaches in the next few minutes. But marriage represents God on the earth. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, same paragraph. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, Paul is quoting Genesis back here in Genesis chapter 1 and, and chapter 2. Now, I've told you before that the word one, that the two will become one flesh, is the same word in Genesis as it is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So marriage is a representation of the image of God on the earth. Matter of fact, Jesus quoted this in, in the book of Mark. Here's it is in Genesis. God said, let us, notice it's plural, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, and in the image of God, he created them. Now, how did God create his image? The Bible says male and female. He created them. Now, this is fascinating. When God created a picture of himself on the earth, he created male and female. So what that means is male is not the image of God. And all the ladies said, thank God. <laughs> Have you ever thought about this? Satan didn't attack when Adam arrived on the scene. He waited to attack when he saw the image of God come on the scene. When Eve showed up. Are you getting this today? God is a trinity, right? He's a triune God. We can illustrate it uh, this way. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So God is three in one. So I'm going to point my fingers to the camera so everybody can see this. So when God is one essence in three persons. So if you look at it this way, he's one. Or in a different perspective, he's three in one. But pastor, you say that God is three persons, is, one, is, is, is three persons in one because he's a trinity. But marriage is two in one. See, and that's where we get it wrong. Because marriage is a man, a woman, and God. That's how it's designed to work. A man, a woman, and God. And that's why Ecclesiastes says a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, if you say, well, I'm single, pastor. You know, I'm not married. Are you saying I can't represent the image of God on the earth? Uh, first of all, let me remind you that Jesus lived 33 years on the earth and he was single. Paul, who wrote the letter uh, this, in these instructions to the Ephesians, most Bible scholars believe that he was never married as well. What I'm trying to explain to you is that God created a picture on the earth of his relationship with Jesus and his church, and it's called marriage. And that helps us understand what Paul is saying. Now, this is an important uh, thing to say, too. He created as equal, but with order. There's never been an issue in the Bible about equality. There's been issues in our culture about equality, but never in the Bible. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. According to the Bible, men and women are equal before the Lord. It's quiet in here. Either you're really listening. You're really listening is what you're doing. If one is the leader, though, how can you be equal? Again, let's look at through the eyes of Scripture. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are one, but who always comes first? God the Father, right? Right? All are one, but God the Father is always first. Think about it this way. Uh, have you ever watched ballroom dancing? 
By the way, we have a couple of professional dancers in our church, or professional ballroom dancers. I, I was this close to asking them to do a demonstration today, uh, but that didn't work out. But the reality is, uh, if you are doing it well, if you're dancing well, and to the natural eye, it looks like they are just flowing together you know, as, as one in harmony and unity. But if you talk to any dance instructor, they'll be able to tell you that one of them is leading. Now, you and I may not be able to tell which one is leading, but how many know it takes both of them to decide to move together? Are you with me? So Paul says, this is the mystery of Christ in the church. The key to marriage is the cross. And so Paul is saying that marriage represents Christ and the church. So as a husband, you are representing Christ's relationship to the church. That's, that, that's your role. The whole purpose of marriage is to be a witness to the world of Christ and the church. And as a woman, you are imaging the relationship of the church to Jesus. That's why God created husbands and wives. So guys, let's imagine, let's illustrate it this way. You're, you're trying to win someone to the Lord. Uh, perhaps it's a friend, it's a coworker or, or a neighbor. And let's say his name is Jake. And uh, Jake says, okay, so you're trying to win him to the Lord. And Jake says, okay, if I give my life to Jesus... Um, how is God going to treat me? How is Jesus going to treat me? We should be able to say, God is going to treat you the same way that I treat my wife. Because that's why God created marriage. So, but what if Jake says, you mean uh, God's going to uh, laugh at me? Put me down? Talk behind my back? God's going to order me around? Is he going to want to get saved? What Jake should say is, you know, if I'm going to be loved and honored and treated like royalty, if Jesus is going to treat me the way you treat your wife, sign me up. I want Jesus. Let's, let's turn it to the other side. Ladies, if you were to go, if you say you're talking to another lady, I don't really know how to pray. How do I talk to the Lord? So if we use this illustration from scripture that, that a, a wife's relationship to her husband is like uh, the church is to Jesus, you might, say, uh, you might say, well, you talk to the Lord the same way I talk to my husband. You mean I can cuss him out? I can be disrespectful? You mean I can talk about his weaknesses to everybody else? Come on, somebody. This is what Paul's talking about. He says, this is the mystery. This is the key. The mystery of marriage is Christ in the church. See, I think now we can understand better the context of what the Bible says about marriage. And now these directives that Paul gives to husbands and wives are going to make sense. So let's, let's dive into what Paul says to husbands, and let's dive into what Paul says uh, about wives. By the way, uh, Paul gives three times more verbal real estate to instructions to men than to women. And the ladies say, of course he is, because they're hard-headed, right. stuff like that. All right, let's go. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And what does that mean? For us now, it means we need to sacrifice for her. If you're married and you're a husband, you sacrifice for your wife. I think most husbands, if you ask them, would say, you know what? I'd take a bullet for my wife. You know, if her life was in danger, I would step in front of that bullet. That's great. I'm glad that's true. But if you're willing to take a bullet, then you should probably be willing to make any sacrifice short of that for your wife as well. How about listening to your wife? How about helping her? How about encouraging her? Guys, let me ask, if you're married, when was the last time you sacrificed for your wife? Now, now by the way, uh, this, is not the kind of, uh, this is not the kind of love that you just do because you feel like it. 
I mean, no, you have to make it a choice. You have to choose to lay your life down. And by the way, the feelings are going to follow your choices. Amen? Uh, I heard a proverb that went like this. A happy man marries the girl he loves. A happier man loves the girl he marries. Here we go. In the Message Bible, the same verse says, husbands, go all out in your love for your wives. So we need to ask ourselves, guys, when was the last time we're going all out for our wives? Here we go. Verse 26. To make her holy... This is God's instructions to husbands to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle. Look, it says wrinkly. We'll have to fix that the next time. (laughs) I'm not sure if that's meant for somebody in this service or not. (laughs) Don't be wrinkly. All right. Or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Thank you, Jesus, for that uh, humorous moment. We probably needed it at that particular time. Well, what what is Jesus saying here? What What did Jesus do for his bride? He made her holy. Are you with me? He took responsibility for our sin, even though it wasn't his fault. So what's Paul saying to, his, to all the guys. He goes, guys, you got to own your responsibility. An older pastor gave me some advice uh, years ago. He said, Wayne, you've got to understand that when you're married, you are responsible for the condition of your marriage. Whatever's going on in your marriage right now is your responsibility. If things aren't going well at your house, it's on you to make it right. If there's an issue going on in your family, you own the responsibility of dealing with it. And then he said to me these words, it may not be your fault, but it's still your responsibility. Wow. I remember hearing those words like, really? Listen, that makes a lot of sense when we look at it through the eyes of the cross of Jesus, right? Jesus took responsibility for our sin. And it wasn't his fault. So we've got to own responsibility for our families regardless whose fault it is. I'm preaching better than your amen. So guys, if your family's not going well... Take responsibility to make it better. You take the steps needed to address the issues. You make sure your family's in church. You get involved in the marriage small group. If necessary, you make the appointment to go see the counselor. Come on, somebody. You take the responsibility for disciplining your kids. I'm not saying you have to do it yourself, but she doesn't want to do it by herself. Are you with me? Uh, Guys, your wife doesn't want to have to lead spiritually. She wants you to own that responsibility. And so, guys, we have to fight passiveness. And Paul is calling men to not be passive, but to own responsibility. Good preaching, amen. Amen. Verse 27, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. Notice again that Paul repeats himself. Again, ladies understand why, right? You have to repeat yourself with guys. So Paul says the same thing. You got to love your wife as you love yourself. Now, isn't it interesting that Paul doesn't give this same instruction to women as he does to men? He doesn't say women, wives love your husbands as you love yourself. He only says it to the guys. It doesn't seem fair. Uh. There, until you understand the nature of men, right? There was a study done in Yorkshire, England, how often men and women look at themselves in a mirror in the matter of a day. Men look at a mirror 23 times a day. Women, on average, 16 times a day. Guys, when it comes to us, I love me some me. <laughs> Again, This is probably not true of every female, 
but a lot of times a woman will look in the mirror and all she sees is flaws. A guy can be overweight and old and wrinkly, like the scripture <laughs> said. Like, I look good, you know. How many know what I'm talking about? So Paul, <laughs> I'm not saying I do that. I'm just saying some guys do that. What Paul is saying in marriage, we have a tendency to put ourselves first. What about me? What about my rights? How many know that's what our culture is telling us? Me, 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 me. But in marriage, we put our spouse first. Your priority is your relationship with God. Your second priority is your relationship with your spouse. I'm going to repeat that because there's a lot of us that need to hear that. Your number one priority is your relationship with God. Your second priority is your relationship with your spouse before your kids, before anything else. Now, I was having a conversation with a young man from our church a while back and, uh, you know, married in the last few years. And, and I said, hey, how are things going? And he was, he was talking uh, to me and he made this statement to me. He goes, he goes, things really improved at my house when I realized that when I got home from work, I was going to my second job. I know some people hear that, and say, that's not very romantic. But I'm telling you, that's huge. Because what he's saying was, I learned to make my relationship with my wife a priority. There are some things that Paul says to some wives. He says, uh, let's go back here. He says, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, so we need to prioritize her. Here's what he says to wives. He says, wives must respect her husband. Respect your husbands. And of course, that's easy. We need to respect him. Uh, What does it mean to show respect to your husband? We've talked about this many times in our church. Men run on praise. If you do the Five Love Languages book, the vast majority of men will come out with two top love languages, words of affirmation or physical touch. There's something that God has wired men that we just need the respect and admiration of other people, especially our wives. Somebody put it this way, men want to live in houses where they are praised. So he says to respect him. And then he says in verse 22, uh, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Okay, pastor, this is the one I want you to talk about. What is he talking about here uh, in, in these verses? The word submit has a lot of emotional baggage in our culture, right? And so, but the reality is it's a military term, uh, which means to voluntarily place oneself under someone else's authority. And if we see it through the eyes of the cross, get this, Jesus chose to subject himself, first of all, to his parents. He could have said, Hey, uh, Joe, Mary, I kind of know better than you. But he chose to subject himself to his parents. And then he chose to subject himself to the authorities when he easily could have called 10,000 angels and all this stuff would be done. And he chose to subject himself to us because he came to serve, not to be served. Submission is something that Jesus chose to do, and if Jesus can choose to do it, we can too. Now, I think in our culture, what this means is we need to allow him to lead. A lot of people get this wrong, and they read Paul's verses, and they walk away. A guy says, I'm the boss. I'm in charge. That's not what Paul says. Paul says you're responsible. And how many know that's a difference? What's the difference between a boss and a leader? A lot. I asked that question on social media earlier this week. I had over 100 responses. Most people didn't realize the context I was asking it was marriage. But if you go back and read all of those statements and apply them to marriage, it's powerful. Paul, this scripture interprets scripture, right? So Paul uses another word to illustrate marriage. And when he says in 2 Corinthians, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. 
So he describes marriage as being yoked together. Believe it or not, a family in our church loaned this to me. This is a yoke. Okay, so what happens in a yoke? You have an oxen on one side and an oxen on another side. They are yoked together. They have to work together to pull the plow, pull the cart. Are you with me? And so Paul paints the picture that marriage is people being yoked uh, together. This is pretty powerful because a yoke is what you put on two oxen who are working together. And so, and when they look, it's not like this. One's in front and the other's in back. It's like this, shoulder to shoulder, side by side. What, what I'm trying to say is that you got to work together in marriage. Uh, I can tell you that in our home, that I don't make any decision without talking to my wife. We come to agreement on almost every decision before we do it. And how many know this has worked out well for me? Uh, one illustration is 25 years ago, uh, we were praying about the future. We were youth pastors at a church, small town in Indiana. And we were praying about the future and what God wanted for us. And we felt like God was transitioning us into lead uh, pastor ministry. And, uh, and so we set aside a day a week to fast and pray about the future. We get a phone call from our, our, lead, our state leader, district leader, uh, the district superintendent said, hey, there's a church in New Whiteland with a lot of potential. He goes, he goes, I think that would be, that would work out well for you. So on the phone, I said to him, Thank you, we'll pray about it, and I'll get back with you. I hung up the phone, I told Tracy about the conversation, she said, call that man back right now. <laughs> You've been praying, we've been praying about this for a year. This is God's will, let's go. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank God, I listened to my wife. Are you hearing me? So this is not about my way or the highway. If you don't do it this way, you know, you know, submit yourself to me. Nothing like that. The Bible says this is Jesus and the church. Amen. This is Jesus and the church. Now let's bring this in for a landing. What does this mean for us in our culture in 2022? Well, it's got a lot of ramifications, doesn't it? Because our culture hates this. But God's word is true in every culture and every time for all time. And so we have to wrestle with this and ultimately follow God's plan because he's the one who designed families. He's the one who designed marriage. And if his way, if we need to do it his way, if we want the results that he wants us to have, not to just be happy, we'll be happy. Not to just be blessed, but we'll be blessed. But ultimately, we will be a witness and a testimony to the world of what it means to follow Jesus. Can I tell you that as a pastor, what I want for this church, I want to be the kind of church that helps families learn what it means to follow Jesus, that strengthens marriages to learn what the Bible says about how marriage works. So can I tell you that uh, we, I need some spiritual fathers and mothers. Maybe you've been married for more than a minute to come alongside some younger couples. And we've got a lot of them in our church. And, and, and you, maybe your small group in the future should be, hey, I'm just going to come along and help you. I just want to coach you. I just want to pray for you. I just want to be there for you when you ask questions. I need some spiritual fathers to, and mothers to do that. I need some spiritual mothers to come alongside some young ladies or, or people who have had negative experiences and just walk with them through the, the seasons of life to help them and to coach them. Some of you last week, you're like, what's my ministry? Can I tell you, for some of you, this is your ministry, is mentoring other women, guys, mentoring other guys, helping them and growing in their relationship with Jesus today. Some of you have been very successful as parents. There's no such thing as a perfect parent, right? But God's given you grace uh, to parent. I need some of you to step up and make that your ministry and come alongside some parents. Because it used to be years ago that the way you learned how to be a parent was by watching your parents. 
But for many people, the last thing they want to do is be like their parents. And so we need some moms and dads to come alongside some younger moms and dads and say, hey, have you ever thought of this? Hey, this really helped us. Hey, here's a great resource that, that we read. Are you getting this today? Your pastor, I thought ministry was standing up and singing or preaching. Or, no, 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 no. Ministry is serving other people. And this is one of the best ways to serve other people is to help them grow. If you're widowed, if you're a widower, if you're single, God wants us to help one another to grow in our relationship with God. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you're married and near your spouse, would you grab them by the hand today? Lord Jesus, we ask you to speak to us about what you're trying to say in this message today. Holy Spirit, we invite you to make it personal with us. Lord, we've been challenged. We've been convicted. Our prayer is that we would reject what culture says. We would embrace what the Word of God says. And Lord, we pray today that our hearts would reflect your heart. We pray that our homes would reflect your grace and your mercy. We pray, Lord, that our marriages would reflect Jesus and the church, the cross. God, I pray for every man here today. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us the same love for our wives as Christ's love for us. I pray for all of the ladies here today. I pray, Lord God, that you would give them the same love for Jesus that you want us to have for you. I pray for any home that's hurting today. I pray for any marriage that is broken today. I pray for every family that is they're not even looking forward to Thanksgiving because there's going to be so much stuff going on. God, I just pray for peace. I pray for healing. I pray for grace through the Holy Spirit. Wrap your arms around them. Encourage them and heal them. I pray for every woman that has been hurt in the past by somebody taking these verses out of context. And God, I pray that through the hurt and through the pain, Lord God, that people would receive the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The greatest gift that God gave to us is his son, Jesus. And the Bible calls us his bride. So salvation is really an invitation to a wedding. Not where you are a spectator, you're the participator, you're the bride. And that's the invitation that Jesus gives to us to be part of his family forever. If you've never received Christ as Savior, can I tell you that today is the greatest day of your life to submit to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, save me. If that's you, pray this out loud. Others are going to pray out loud with you. What would you say, God? Thank you for Jesus Christ for loving me and laying your life down for me. I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Forgive me for my sin. From this day forward, I choose you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.